Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, I have some vintage patterns I want to unbox, and an idea for my next deep dive into vintage pattern explorations. So let's get started. This first tidbit came from Charlotte on Ravelry, and she sent me a link to a blog that's called Thread Forward, and it's described on the, the homepage as one woman's adventures with knitting and history. So obviously, it's going to be interesting to me. The blogger is a woman named Yvonne, and she began knitting her way through a Victorian era knitting book of patterns. Um, starting in about 2015. The 40th and last installment of the blog was posted a couple of years ago, uh, and it ended with a, a pattern for a pence jug. So there are more than 40 patterns in the book, but that looks like that's about as far as she got with the project. This project that she chose for the final blog post, uh, a pence jug, is a little knitted container that basically looks like a jug with a little handle and a spout. And it was meant for just keeping, it's like a penny jar. You just keep your, your pennies, your coins in it, and, you, and it's a little decorative way of doing that. So this is the same pattern that Franklin Habit addressed in one of his knitty columns a number of years ago. And when Franklin did it, he updated the instructions and they were published in knitty so that if, if anybody wanted to knit it, they could do that. So the woman Yvonne who is doing it in her blog post kind of was aware that Franklin had done it but didn't want to look at his interpretation uh, until she had knit through uh, the one that through the same instructions herself to see how it came out. And hers came out slightly different from the way his came out. So that was really interesting to see. The book is called My Knitting Book, and it was by a woman that's just identified as Miss Lambert. So I am going to leave uh, links below to the blog post. And so you can see uh, what she has to say about it. You can look at all of her other blog posts that have to do with this particular project. Within her post, she does link to Franklin's um, knitty column about the same pattern. So I also will leave links to that digitized book of uh, Miss Lambert's patterns so that you can see what they look like. And the link is going to take you right to the page of that book where the pence jug actually is. Uh, if in case you're interested in doing that. So thanks to Charlotte for the heads up about this blog. This next tidbit also came from Charlotte as she sent me a link to a video that's here on YouTube on the Jameson and Smith channel. So Jameson and Smith is a Scottish company that mills and sells Shetland wool yarn. And this video is intended to be a class on borders and edgings in Farrell knitting. But the video starts out, I'd say the first eight minutes or so, the woman teaching the class presents what she calls dot books. And so those were like homemade stitch dictionaries. And it was a way for Farrell knitters to document and keep track of different stitch patterns that they might want to use, whether it was in a sweater or in gloves or something like that. So let me take some, this, I have this book here called Traditional Farrell Knitting. There's several books that have this kind of thing um, that has in, in the book, those kinds of dot patterns. This book is organized in terms of a number of stitch repeats that, and um, maybe number of rows too. I'm not sure if it's number of rows or number of stitches, which is something that you would need to do when you're figuring out, well, I have all of these stitches and I need to figure out uh, what repeats would go in those. So what stitch patterns would I have that could fit evenly in that number of stitches? So it's really cool to see she has, one of the examples that she showed was her mother's uh, notebook. And what these are just basically gridded notebooks and then they put a dot inside each square to keep track of all the stitches. And her mother then also kept notes about the types of garments that she might use those stitch patterns in and then how she would knit those garments. So it was kind of a, a workbook for not just the patterns, but also 
uh, construction information so she could remember how to do those kinds of things. And then the second notebook was a, from a woman who's in her 90s. She started this book probably back in during uh, World War II time period. And she learned all of those patterns from an older cousin who was 30 years older than she was. And so these patterns were dating back into the early 1900s. And so that was one of the interesting things that these handmade books were just passed on. The patterns were passed from person to person. And one of the things that she mentioned was that her mother and then this woman in her 90s, they were from the same place. And so they had a lot of the same stitch patterns in there. And it was sort of represented how people learned from each other um, that lived locally before there were other ways of communicating these different stitch patterns. So I'll leave a link down in the show notes to that video. So if you're interested uh, in those dot books, you can uh, take a look too. This tidbit came to me from Joseph Thomas on Ravelry. And it's an article about some pink headed sheep in Yorkshire. So apparently there was some new equipment. I think it was a red fence that, that was installed near the feeding spot of these sheep. And as they were feeding, their heads would rub up against the fence and the color transferred onto their heads. So there's this whole flock of sheep running around Yorkshire that has pink heads. But I will leave a link down in the show notes to the article if you'd like to read it. It appeared in the Yorkshire. This tidbit showed up on my Twitter feed. Every so often I will see an article or a post or, or something about a woman in science who is also an avid knitter and how she combines her interest in science with her knitting. And in this case, Rachel Kirby knit her PhD. <laughs> She's wearing a circular yoke sweater that she designed herself that features asteroids and meteorites and all sorts of things that are associated with the research for her PhD. So I will leave a link down below to her tweet because there are several tweets in a row that explain everything. Um, but also she did include a link to her research paper that describes um, what it is that is going on in this a sweater and what her research is about. This tidbit also showed up in my Twitter feed. George Barrett Jones wanted to do some sort of an interactive art installation. So he set up a scarf knitting machine that's powered by a stationary bike in a train station in the Netherlands. So the tweet I saw contained a video of this, like a fast motion video showing um, people at this bicycle um, pedaling away and creating a scarf. Um, but there was n n no other information in this tweet. And I did some little research and tried to track him down. So it turns out the video was filmed in 2018. There is a YouTube channel that he created that includes that video. There's only three videos on his channel and that was one of them. And then I was able to find an article about the project. And then there's also an additional link um, that explains, that goes through like to his drawings and the process for how he actually built this cycle powered sc uh, scarf machine. But it's a really fun video to watch. I think it's just like a minute long, maybe it's two minutes long, but I must have watched it like 10 times because it just seemed like everybody was having fun. It's just a really fun video to watch. They're also playing Come On Eileen in the background, which is very bouncy and it's just very peppy and fun. And it looks like people were really enjoying uh, their time waiting on the train platform until their train came on making themselves a scarf. Last week, I was telling you guys about Grace Annis, who was a popular sock designer back in the 19. 40s. When I was doing my research on Grace last week in preparation for Casual Friday, I found a seller on eBay who had a bunch of vintage sock patterns for sale, including a number of, of them that were Grace Ennis patterns. So I bought them and they just came in the mail the other day. So I want to go to the overhead 
and show you what was in my package. So I've got this stack of mostly Grace Ennis patterns, but there's a few others as well. So she has the color picture of what the sock looks like when it's worn. So these types of patterns, this looks like it's done in intarsia completely. There's enough space between these two lines of color that this would just have been done intarsia. And the way that this pattern is laid out suggests that as well. So my experience with knitting argyles in the past have been that you, you knit cuff down and you're knitting flat using intarsia color work a pattern, not stranded color work. And then you knit down to uh, where the heel is. And what you're gonna do is put um, these stitches on hold and these stitches on hold so that the, the center stitches, those are gonna go down the instep, the top of your foot where um, your leg bends and turns into the top of your foot. And so then you would just be knitting across these stitches back and forth flat. Then you come back to these that are on hold and you put these stitches and these stitches all on the same needle. And then you're doing, then you would knit the heel and turn the heel. And so then you'd knit the bottom of the sole just on those stitches. And it isn't until you've knit the sole as long as this is that you would then join in the round and work the toe, the foot. So at the end, you end up with one seam that you sew up the back of the leg and then on the foot, you have two seams. And some people think, oh, that sounds really uncomfortable. Uh, and it's not if you are doing a seaming method where you're only using a half a stitch on each side of the seam. And then it's very small and not terribly noticeable. And the toe itself is done in the round and grafted. So that's not a problem. And feeling a full stitch seam up the back typically isn't a big deal either, although uh, yeah, this this one, I actually might do something like a knit a selvage stitch here so that when the selvage stitch disappeared, you still have the in entire pattern uh, creating. And she might actually uh, suggest doing that. I don't know. But that's how these intarsia patterns were done is that they were largely knit flat and then just in the toe um, is where they were joined in the round. So this one drama oh these are the drama masks the drama the comedy and tragedy masks and you can see them a little more clearly over there this is a uh, western socks with a cowboy hat a couple of six shooters this is interesting so this has more of a just a graph interesting graphing graphic design octagon and diamonds socks Thunderbird socks and Thunderbird car charm. Oh, like if you wanted to knit it in regular sock yarn. Interesting. So if you wanted to do that, hang it from your, your rear view mirror. These are little overlapping diamond clock socks. So clocks refers to a design that would be coming down the side of the leg. This is a three color plaid sock. It's kind of interesting. And there's a second one. So I have two copies of this pattern. This one is in really good shape and this one has been used. And this is a diagonal stripe uh, pattern. That's interesting. Anchors. And then it looks like somebody was putting in designs for some words in here. Which is interesting. I don't know why what that was about. Cards. That's kind of uh, cool. And then this is gun club hunt socks for hunting, which not really my thing. Circus seals and another sort of, oh, this is a different company. I remember they said this is called chart knit pattern. So it's the same idea, but it's a different um, design company. So uh, this one is some interesting plaids, and this one is 
some a beer mug. These kind of mid-century uh, charted pattern designs were really common. This is one I already have in my collection and they were called Knitograph. And so it'd be a pattern for a little sweater. And this was a Minnesota company. So they would have all of the instructions, but then they like, here's the, the entire sleeve instruction was charted out so you could see the whole um, shape of the pattern. And then they had, let's see, that's upside down. So then here's the, the different sizes um, for, the, um, for the back. And then for the front, they have it um, sort of bigger so that you can uh, see it in more detail. And this is probably more like actual size possibly um, as well which is kind of interesting. So this is, this is something that I actually do for my own knitting patterns when I want to see how the stitch pattern is going to lay out. I will in my Stitch Mastery is the program that I use for uh, stitch pattern layout. And usually I'd use that for uh, cables and texture. But when I wanna see how everything is going to lay out in terms of the actual shape of the garment, I will do this. I'll do something just in the size I'm going to knit where I'll lay it out and I'll have the arm sh hole shaping and everything so that I can just see how I want to do things. And particularly with texture stitch patterns where I'm going to have to be decreasing and maintaining the pattern, I kind of want to see how things are going to hit and, and how I'm going to handle that at the shaping points. But I thought that was really interesting. And also they're showing, they have instructions for doing duplicate stitch. So if you want to do little um, bits of color rather than working in intarsia, you can do that. So if you don't, know what intarsia is. I have, I did some videos earlier, I think it was this year, on intarsia and different ways of managing the color and just the basics about how intarsia was worked. I, think, I believe I did that in conjunction with my uh, 1940s vintage sweater, which was intarsia. So one of the things I have been thinking about doing, and I've talked about this a few times, is doing some sort of project, uh, maybe not as long or as in-depth as my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade, but some sort of an exploration of the evolution of sock patterns in the 20th century. Uh, the mid the mid century was huge for socks, particularly for men, they all these really cool graphic designs and um, argyles and all, di all different kinds of things. Um, and mostly they were aimed at men because women were wearing stockings. And so most of the socks that women wore might've been for sports or outdoor activities or, or something like that. I have been thinking that I would like to explore some of the really interesting sock constructions that they used in conjunction with these color patterns. And as in addition, I wanna kind of go back to the early part of the century and look at how socks, uh, the sort of the standard way that socks for men were created. You know, again, for women, it was stockings into the 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, so it would have been knitted stockings and then gradually silk stockings would have been, would have taken over in the nylons. And men wore stockings as well, but there were socks for men, even in the 19th century and uh, certainly into the early uh, 20th century. So I, I kind of wanted to just look at the sock itself and not so much the stocking and just look at the different um, constructions, the heels the, that were typical, and then, um, and then take a look at some of the things that they were doing when World War I came into play and uh, socks were very important. People were knitting socks um, for the soldiers because in this trench warfare, and feet got wet and it was really important to keep them dry. Um, and so people were knitting socks like crazy for about four years at that time period. Um, and then um, looking at what happened with socks um, in sort of the World War II era, I don't really know what was going on so much in the 20s and 30s. There's a lot of sock knitting talked about, uh, pro, you know, up through World War One, and then I don't see much about it after that until about the 1940s. So I'd be interested in in exploring the 20s and 30s and seeing what's going on in there as well. So some of the construction methods were really aimed at replacing parts of socks that would have gotten worn out. 
because nowadays we have uh, nylon available as an add-in to socks that really help for the longevity. But um, in those earlier times, they would have had to replace them and darn them much more frequently than we do today. And so there are a lot of things that they did to make the replacement of heels a little bit easier. And even back into the 19th century, there were things that they might have done to make the foot of a sock um, replaceable without having to maybe re-knit the instep, just having to re-knit the sole. So those are some of the things that I'm kind of thinking of looking at. Um, I have a fair number of sock books from the mid mid-century time period and then from like the World War One era and the late 19th century I have uh, a number of patterns but there are places where I am I'm missing um, patterns and I'd be interested to see how that might have just stayed the same or how it might have uh, changed or been tweaked and during different time periods. So that is something I am thinking about as I am also thinking about things, directions I wanna take the Technique Tuesday side of my channel. Just thinking about what kinds of projects, uh, personal projects that I could also share with you might be interesting um, to explore next. So uh, what I wanna do is go through and show you a few of the things that I'm thinking about uh, from uh, sock knitting, some of the interesting constructions. Uh, some of the stuff is just really cool uh, stitch patterns, but then there are some really interesting constructions uh, that I'm interested in pursuing as well. So I have a whole folder that I, where I keep a vintage sock pattern books, and I, I probably have a, a number of patterns in other places as well. Um, but this is the type of thing I'm looking at. I actually have th three copies of this book because it was produced by the by Bear Brand and then they would reissue it uh, under different labels. Like, um, so the, the first version I have of it, it was published, I think, in the 1940s. I don't have the cover for it, but I can tell from the, like the, the yarns that they're saying to to use is a bear, ba bear brand. And then when they printed it uh, later, it, it had this Bucilla Bear Brand Fleischer Botany label. And then they were calling for one of, you know, it's one of those different brands in, instead. And then gradually uh, they came out with, uh, this one is Nomis. Um, these are all these companies that would buy each other out. And it's the same socks again. Um, and it's just, and then at this point, they, they did some typesetting to replace what the materials were calling for was just generic fingering weight. Um, so, but they kept all of the same uh, pictures and everything. These are the types of socks that, you know, that, that you would see in that mid-century time period. Um, so for me, it's, it's fun to, to look at these and see all the different uh, color work. One of the interesting construction methods is this method of uh, knitting an argyle sock, these diamonds, without having to knit multiple colors in the same row. So I was explaining with these Grace Ennis patterns that typically you would knit the, the leg flat back and forth and you do all your color changing uh, and then you'd be doing the seaming up the side and you have to do that with intarsia you can't really knit it in the round anytime someone talks about intarsia in the round they're talking about knitting um, a seamless tube but you're still having to knit back and forth because of the way that intarsia is constructed so what was interesting in this book is that they have some of these argyle socks they call no bobbin or bobbinless socks. So when you are working back and forth in all these different colors, you'd have a little bobbin that would hold the different colors and a lot of times they'd get tangled around each other and it's a real pain in the rear. Also, then you'd end up having to seam up the back of the leg. Well, what they've done with some of these here is that you'd only ever have to knit with one color at a time and you wouldn't have to do any seaming and you'd end up with a tube. So you'd be working um, starting at the cuff and you would work this white part and but when you got to right here you'd be working back and forth decreasing to kind of create this triangle 
um, and then you would knit this one back and forth. And so you'd have these two triangles here. Then you'd take the red yarn and you'd only be working with the red yarn. You'd start at the base of here and you'd go back and forth picking up a stitch along each edge here. And so you're creating the shapes separately, one color at a time. You don't get anything tangled. You don't have to do any seaming. So I'm sure it has its own uh, disadvantages uh, to this particular system, but I thought that was an interesting solution to uh, one of the frustrations of knitting these color block patterns. So that's something that I'm interested in trying out as well. So there's all kinds of these really cool uh, color patterns in these different books. Beehive came up with something that they called uh, their, it's an innovation, and I think they patented it for a while, but it's now, of course, out of the patent, it no longer applies. Uh, but you can kind of see this little uh, white line right here and then across the toe. And so they came up with a way of adding the heel in so that it would be replaceable later because you wouldn't have nylon. Um, and so how could you, you know, maintain most of the sock and just replace the heel? And that, that different colored yarn helps you find where that point is where that would be attached. And they had a couple of different heels that they did. This one they called Innovation. And there were, there were a few different ways that they did that kind of heel and they had one that was called the Aladdin heel and as well here's this Aladdin heel and they're kind of showing you how everything comes together. This is interesting to me just to understand what was going on. It's not necessarily something I need in my socks because of the nylon content and I'm not hard on my socks but it is something that I would like to understand about socks from this era. So there are all kinds of really um, cool patterns to explore and construction methods. And so that's something that I am I'm looking at to do uh, in the coming year. So I'm working on some videos for the end of the year that have to do with various ways of decreasing the crown of a hat, whether it's you know decorative purposes, you wanna change the way it looks, uh, whether you wanna maintain the stitch pattern or just sort of being as on a, intrusive as possible. So I'm trying to address as many different scenarios as I can. I won't be able to address everything, but let me know if you have any sort of burning questions about frustrations you might've had with trying to change the way that you are doing a hat, if you need to adjust it in different ways, uh, just let me know down in the comments below. So that's it for this week's Casual Friday. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.